In this video, we will design the brace frames and moment frames in the warehouse building shown for gravity, snow, and wind loads as specified by ASCE 7 load combinations using LRFD. We're going to use the direct analysis method. The problem requires us to maintain columns no larger than the W24 series and beams no larger than the W30 series. We are going to assume the maximum initial out of plumbness permitted by the AISC, which is 0.2%. The serviceability limit of maximum allowed story drift caused by wind is also given. We are limited to using ASTM A992 for the beams and columns and to using A36 for the circular bracing rods. The roof is rigid. The dead snow and wind loads are provided as follows. We can extract the material properties of both A992 and A36 from table 2-3 in the AISC manual. All lateral load resistance in the east-west direction is provided by tension only X bracing in the north and south end bays as shown in section A-A. -A. All lateral load resistance in the north-south direction is provided by moment frames on each north-south column line. A moment connection is provided between the exterior column and beam at the end bay of each north-south frame as specified in section B-B. Assume that this moment connection is field welded with a complete joint penetration weld at the beam flange to column flange connection. A beam to column web connection is provided using a bolted single plate connection. The tension rod to gusset connections are assumed to be pinned connections using a standard clevis and pin that can be chosen from the following two tables in the AISC manual. Beams within the braced frame are oriented with the web vertical and are bolted into the column flanges using double angles. A single gusset plate connecting the tension rod is shop welded to the beam flange and field bolted to the column. All other columns outside the brace frames and moment frame bays are leaning columns with simple beam to column connections. Design is an iterative process. The first step is to estimate member sizes that are used in an analysis and then check for conformance of strength requirements of the AISC specification and serviceability drift limits that are established by the designer. In this type of building, brace frames are often controlled by strength limit states while moment frames are controlled by stiffness. The preliminary sizes for the members are defined in the top table. Assume that roof purlins at 6 feet and 8 inches center to center spacing in the east west direction span to girders in the north south direction located at column lines. Assume 7 pound per square foot framing self weight for all steel framing, including purlins, columns, beams, and braces. Note, use this weight for calculating the minimum lateral loads. The estimated dead load is then 25 pound per square foot plus 7 pounds per square foot, which equates to 32 pounds per square foot. Note, the weights specified include an allowance for all steel framing and exterior cladding. In order to make sure this is modeled correctly in a finite element software of your choice, please make sure that the beam and column orientation is right. Here I am using SAP 2000, but any software that has the ability to include P small and P capital delta effects in a nonlinear analysis can be used. Here we can see that I assigned the north-south direction in the direction of the y axis and the east-west direction to the x axis. We can see the moment frames and respectively the braced frames. Make sure to release the right boundary conditions of the respective member ends to simulate the right support conditions and connections as indicated earlier. We can see that in the direction of the moment frames, 
the first and last columns are connected with the moment connection to the beams and thus make sure to not release the moment in those positions. Make sure to set the forces in the braces as tensile forces only. Do notice, however, that this is a nonlinear behavior and in order for it to take effect, a nonlinear analysis is required. In order to make the roof act as a rigid roof, we assign the rigid diaphragm constraint in the z-axis to all joints on the roof floor and thus all will move together in the horizontal plane. The maximum allowable drift limit can be calculated by rearranging the following equation. We obtain 3.6 inches. To find out the drift of the first order analysis, we create three linear static load cases and add their results together. This is possible because superposition is possible for linear analysis. To find out the drift of the second order analysis, we create a nonlinear static load case that includes both P capital and P small delta effects that include the loads of all three load cases multiplied by their respective scale factors in the load combination. This has to be done because superposition is not possible for nonlinear analysis. After running the first order analysis, we obtain a value for the story drift of 2.13 inches, which does not exceed the maximum allowed limit, so we check the second order result. After running the second order analysis, we obtain a value for the story drift of 2.65 inches, which does not exceed the maximum allowed limit as well, and thus the member sizes are sufficient for the serviceability limit state. For strength analysis, we have to apply all the following LRFD load combinations. Notice that we are adding the notional loads to each of the load combinations and not only to the gravity-only load combinations shown here. This is because we are not yet sure if the ratio of the drift of second-order analysis to that of the first-order analysis is less than 1.5. If we use the values obtained from the serviceability state, we get 1.24, which is very close to 1.5, and thus, to be on the safer side, we add the notional loads in the north-south direction anyway. However, we will not add them for the load cases in the east-west directions shown here. Due to symmetry of the problem, we can reduce the load combinations by half. To know how to apply each of these load cases, I will show you how each was implemented in SAP 2000. The first loads were the notional loads in Y direction which were implemented as joint loads in the global y direction with a value of 0.23 kips. This was calculated by using the load combination that generates the highest gravity loads. This would be combination 5. The total gravity load is calculated by multiplying each of the debt and snow loads by the total area of the roof. The total notional load is then calculated by using the load combination to scale and add the total loads and taking 0.2% of the result. The individual applied load for each column would then be the total notional load divided by the number of columns. Similarly, we obtain the same value for the notional loads in X. The net load is carried onto the beams by using the two-way tributary area method because spans in both directions of the area have equal lengths. The snow load is distributed the same way onto the roofing beams. The wind loads were distributed on the frames on either side of the building using the one-way method because the distance between the columns is greater than the story height. The same was done for the wind in the Y direction. Notice that this wind load is not accurate and you should refer to ASCE7 to extract the correct wind load that is not only applied to the sides of the structure but also the top which can be suction or a pushing load depending on the building geometry. After running all load cases in both directions we see that we were right to include the notional loads in the y direction but not the x direction 
as many of the ratios of the drift exceeds 1.5 in the y direction, but none are exceeded in the x direction. Notice that the limit of 1.5 applies when the stiffnesses in the model are not reduced by 20%. If the stiffnesses are reduced, then a limit of 1.71 should be used. For the strength design of columns and beams, the member stiffnesses had to be reduced and each combination had to be run separately to obtain the results of second order effects. The maximum moments and axial loads were looked at in typical internal moment frame members and maximum values were used for design. These are summarized in the table. The governing load combination is combination 16 from the table, where the ultimate compressive load is 91.6 kips and the ultimate bending moment is 10,800 kip inch. AISC manual table 1-1 indicates that W24 by 117 is slender for compression when the yield strength is equal to 50 KSI. Therefore, the design compressive strength is determined from section E7 of the AISC specification. The y-axis slenderness ratio KL over RY is greater than the one in the x-axis and thus it controls the strength. We proceed to find the critical stress, as we did in the previous videos, for compression design. For details, please watch the video in the description down below. The web is slender, but it passes the width reduction check, and thus no reduction in the area is required when calculating the nominal compressive strength. We proceed to find the compressive strength, and we find out that it is much higher than the applied axial load and thus we proceed to the bending check. From AISC manual table 3-2 we obtain the following. Because the length of the column is between L sub P and L sub R, use the following equation taken from the AISC manual and the variables from the AISC manual table 3-2 to interpolate between the available strength at L sub P and the available strength at L sub R. From AISC table 3-1 and AISC specification equation F1-1, C sub B is equal to 1.67. Note that there is a linear moment diagram between the support and the brace point. Therefore, the design flexural strength is determined as follows. The available strength is greater than the applied load and thus we proceed. We check the interaction between bending moment and axial compression using section H1 from the AISC specification. Because the axial force over the axial strength is less than 20%, we use the following interaction equation. The result is less than 1 and thus we proceed to design the beams. The governing load combination for member B1 is combination 15 from the table, where the mid-span moment is 9490 kip inch. We again use table 3-2 to obtain the following values. Because the unbraced length of the beam is less than L sub P, the bending strength is the bending resistance due to yielding, which is 1390 kip feet, or 16680 kip inch according to AISC specification section F2. It is greater than the applied moment, and thus we proceed. The tensile forces in the bracing members for different load cases are summarized in the table. The required tensile strength of the 1.25 inch diameter rod is 33.2 kips for combination 9. Members in tension can either fail due to yielding or due to rupture. The member has lower strength in yielding. Nevertheless, it is still greater than the applied tensile load in the bracing member, and thus it passes the test. We can conclude the following observations. The direct analysis method provides a more economical design for the moment frame portion of this problem compared to the effective length method because there is no limitation to the ratio of second to first order drift ratios. 
There were no seismic requirements for this problem, but the lateral load system in the north-south moment frame direction may not be satisfactory in higher seismic zones because of the magnitude of the second order effects. This would need to be checked according to ASCE 7 section 12.8.7.3. The moment frame design is strongly influenced by the large leaning column load and the fact that there are relatively few moment connections. The braced frame design is controlled by strength, which is common for braced frames. Because there is no second order stiffness limit for the direct analysis method, the moment frame design was controlled by the strength check as well. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.